It's a freezing February midnight in northern France. Former enemies, French and German, meet to commemorate the bloodiest battle in history, which began on this night 75 years ago. Verdun. The tragedy of the First World War is etched into the collective memory of European people. It was a watershed in their self-confidence, questioning their common faith in progress, patriotism, in civilization itself, and even in the existence of a benign God. Under the flags of past battles, the old familiar rituals of Christian sacrifice take place. Only a lifetime ago, three quarters of a million people died here for a couple of square miles of ground, when the heirs to the culture of Voltaire were bled white by the heirs of Goethe and Beethoven. A memory still terrible, but fading now as only the very old remain to remember the pointlessness of it all. Those of us born later can only imagine. We that are young, said Shakespeare, shall never see so much, nor live so long. nineties after centuries of conflict the Europeans are finally moving to unite the descendants of the barbarians of the Franks Goths Angles and Saxons the first people in history to spread their civilization across the whole planet The battlefield of Verdun is the most poignant reminder of how a supposedly rational and humane civilization can descend to terrifying violence and irrationality, all in the name of civilization. And that brings us to that most difficult of tasks, which is to see ourselves as others see us, to see our culture as we would a foreign country. And there, the inescapable lesson of history is that for all the great achievements of the West, for all its humanistic values and its egalitarian principles, its character is touched by a deep strain of violence. And that's the paradox which confronts us as we look to the future of civilization at a time when all across the world the values of the West are supposed to have triumphed.
We Greeks live around the sea like frogs around a pond, said Socrates. This is Samos, and here began the quest which would lead Western man to the exploration of space and the conquest of nature itself. Here for the first time, Western man speculated on the composition of the universe observing the geometries of nature. Questioning the role of humanity in this order. The existence of God. On Samos and its neighboring coasts were born the scientists who laid the foundations of our modern view of the universe. The most famous was Pythagoras, author of the theorem we all learn at school, and in a mountain cave here, a tradition of him has still survived. It might sound like a simple folk tale, but the tradition was first recorded not long after Pythagoras's day, and it contains an important kernel of truth that for all their brilliant qualities of mind, the Greeks had to borrow from Africa and Asia to create their civilization. In the West, we look upon this moment as the birth of science and reason, but it would be more accurate to describe it as the birth of Western science and reason, because right across the old world at this time, around 500 BC, it was an astonishingly creative epoch, the Axis Age, the time of... Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, of the Buddha and the great grammarians and philosophers in India, of the Zoroastrians, the Jewish prophets, and the philosophers and poets here in Greece, all of them grappling in their own way with the ultimate question, the nature of reality itself. Still the ultimate question, whatever your line of business, whether it's poetry, religion, or particle physics. But this was the first time that the West, Europe, had participated in these great currents of civilization emanating from Asia. And here in Samos, it's easy to see why, because that's Asia over there. It's that close. In fact, the Greek word Asia originally meant simply that coastline in front of us. So that's the beginning of the great land mass, the teeming heartland of civilization, stretching away across the fertile crescent to Iraq, Iran, India and China. So not surprisingly, Pythagoras and his contemporaries had imbibed Asian ideas, Babylonian astronomy and mathematics, Indian ideas of about the soul and about rebirth. They may have transformed them with their own genius, but the Greeks still shared the basic beliefs of those other civilizations, that the universe was an ordered, beautiful and harmonious whole. In their language, a cosmos. Man is by nature a political animal, said the Greeks. The new scientific view of the world was the catalyst for a new politics, democracy. And the first democracy was Athens. Buildings of classical Athens, like the Parthenon, are monuments to that new order. Like 18th century Britain or America, Greek democracy was limited 
It excluded slaves and women. But it took the essential step of putting politics into the hands of the citizens. That was what the Greeks called politismos, civilization. For the Greeks, the essential quality of civilized life was humanism. The idea that man is the measure of all things, that the fulfillment of each individual's potential was the goal of civilization. This idea permeated all the legacies in art, philosophy and literature which the Greeks bequeathed to our modern world. In the dramatic festivals, 30,000 citizens saw these great issues of fate and freedom acted out for all to see. The Greeks understood early on that civilization is fragile, that it is a hard thing to maintain an open society, that the irrational will always threaten to burst out in human life with terrifying force, no matter how noble society's ideals. said Aristotle are intelligent and free and have the capacity to rule all mankind. And in the 4th century BC, under Aristotle's pupil, Alexander the Great, they invaded the Near East. The valley of the Nile thronged with Greek colonists. In Upper Egypt, the monuments were covered with graffiti by awestruck Greek tourists. To think, fumed an Egyptian priest, we taught these upstarts all they know. And at Luxor, in the inner shrine of the ancient Egyptian temple, striding like a pharaoh of old, is the violent golden boy of Western history, Alexander himself. Overrunning Babylonia and Persia, the Greeks now crossed the Khyber Pass and poured into India, building their colonies on the northwest front. Alexander's successors went further still. In the second century BC, they sent devastating expeditions down the Ganges sacking the ancient religious center at Benares. And at the little village of Kasambi is graphic evidence of the trail of destruction. Here, a Buddhist monastery has been excavated, which was swept by a Greek firestorm, torched by Greek mercenaries sweltering out here, so far from home. Uh, These were terrible times, said the Indians. The vicious but valiant Greeks ruined our land with fire and famine, killing women and children, and even our cows. Such was the first time the West went out to the world. But the Greek conquests liberated tremendous historical energies. Trade routes now opened through Central Asia on the Silk Route to China. In earlier times, said the historian Polybius, the world's history had been a series of unrelated episodes. But from now on, history becomes an organic whole. 
The affairs of Europe and Africa are connected with those of Asia, and all events bear a relationship and contribute to a single end. Riding the monsoon winds, Greek and Roman merchants now sailed into the Indian Ocean to trade in spices. Each year, the Roman balance of payments ran millions into the red to fill the pepper barns by the river Tiber. It was the beginning of a vast exchange of cultures and ideas, the first glimmering of a world economy. The Romans had united the Mediterranean world, conquering the Iron Age cultures of Europe, along with the sophisticated city dwellers of Greece, Syria and Egypt. Brilliant architects, engineers and military planners. Like all empires, theirs was based on military might, on slavery and cruelty. At its height, the empire extended from Hadrian's Wall in Scotland to the Persian Gulf, and you could call yourself a citizen of Rome, whether you lived in Manchester, Athens, Luxor, or even briefly Uruk in the baking south of Iraq. But unlike India or China, there was no binding religious or social ethic to hold its disparate parts together. And in the fourth century, it entered a great crisis, economic, social, and especially spiritual. And the vacuum was filled by an obscure cult, one of many new religions arising out of the spiritual ferment of the late antique world, Christianity. In Egypt in particular, a form of Christianity developed which would exert a profound and lasting influence on the Western mind, monasticism. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century, and with that a set of beliefs, myths and taboos deriving from the Iron Age people of Palestine and ultimately from the Bronze Age cities of Iraq was accepted by the rulers of the West as the final revelation of history. And even though the Roman Empire itself fell to the northern barbarians in 410 AD, this sense of historical mission was never lost. The triumph of Christianity was another product of the extraordinary fertility of ideas born in the intractable landscapes of Syria, Palestine and Iraq, a testimony to the continuing inspiration which the West has drawn from the more ancient cultures to the East. After the fall of the Roman Empire, tribes of Germanic barbarians made their new home in the ruined provinces.
out on the wild shores of Britain with a religion from the Near East, a monasticism from Egypt and a written language from Italy, the Anglo-Saxons started from scratch to build their new order with the optimism of all immigrants thrown on strange shores. The ruins of that order are still around us, silent shapers of our modern world. Here on the River Tyne in Northumbria, the searcher for that past has to travel back through many histories, through the ruins of later empires built on coal, steel and ships. But here at Jarrow is a place as crucial as any in the Western story. To get to it now, you have to cross muddy slakes and reclaimed slag tips. Here in the monastery of St. Peter and Paul, the first great history of the West was written, which spelt out the West's view of its own destiny. The author was a monk here, the Venerable Bede. Bede was the first to use the Anno Domini system of dating history from Christ's birth, which is now used throughout the world. The books written here give clues to his time. The biblical hero David, for example, was a model for the rulers of the barbarian West. Portrayed as the teacher of his people, the psalmist. He's a reminder that the great Western tradition of social legislation and welfare comes not from Greece or Rome, or even the Victorians, but from the Dark Ages. And here's David with the spear of God waging just wars against non-believers. Put the two ideas together and you have the ideal Western ruler from the Crusades to the Gulf War. Bede's history was the most remarkable and the most successful attempt to show how the peoples of the barbarian West in the Dark Ages transformed themselves through the agency of civilization. Christian, Latin, Mediterranean civilization. Bede was a thoroughgoing European in that respect. In comparison with, say, contemporary Tang China, Bede's Anglo-Saxons and the people of Europe were indeed barbarians. They were impoverished, underdeveloped third world immigrants, as we would say today in the patronizing language of the rich. And yet here on the Northumbrian coast in the 8th century are already the key elements out of which the culture of the modern West would emerge. Judeo-Christian religion and ethics, the remains of Greek and Roman humanism and law, a native Germanic society and language. In the hands of a historian like Bede, that mixture could be made to tell a powerful story that the peoples of the barbarian West were the appointed Christian heirs of the Roman Empire, a chosen people destined to lead us on into the last phase of human history, from the city of man to the city of God. The idea that history is purposive and leads to an appointed end would become one of the driving themes of world culture, from St. Augustine to Marx and from Jarrow to Tiananmen Square. In the medieval era, between the 11th and the 13th centuries, the barbarians came of age. They created the greatest epoch of art and architecture which the world had ever seen the age of cathedrals. Inspired in part by Islamic forms, this was still the first full expression of a distinctively Western genius, and more than that, of the Western soul.
But even during the cathedral age, social forces were at work, which would eventually loosen the hold of the Church of Rome on the former barbarians. This is Norfolk in eastern England. Here, 800 years ago, changes can be detected in ordinary people's lives which would have a crucial bearing on the future. This brings us to one of the most fascinating questions in the story of the rise of the West. How was it that such small-scale countries and economies could end up dominating the world as they've done? As late as 1550, England only had two and a half million people. China and India, with their vast and highly developed economies, had passed a hundred million centuries before. They'd made all the great inventions necessary for scientific and industrial revolutions. How had it happened? Was there something distinctive about the character of the West? Or was it just historical chance? A graveyard in Norfolk may seem a strange place to ask such a question, but some answers may lie here, because across northwestern Europe, and especially here in East Anglia, records of birth, marriage and death suggest that as early as the 12th century, a distinctive character was emerging of late marriage, of small nuclear families, but of also a possessive, property-based individualism and a free market philosophy, which seems uncannily like the seeds of later Western ideas of the ideology which through the English, French and American revolutions became the dominant philosophy of the West and which rules our lives even today. In parts of Western Europe, Men and women were already marrying in their late twenties and having small families. So Western people were beginning to do what today's Chinese, for example, have had to enforce by law. This was the key not just to population control, but to the accumulation of wealth. For with security of life, inheritance and property, you don't need big families. It was the start of a revolution in values which would see the West diverge from all traditional societies. The first signs of Western individualism. And individualism is the key to the Western conception of freedom. An idea which comes not from ancient Athens, but is rooted here in Western Europe. Here, a property-based conception of freedom took shape early on. That's the one here, ten pound. The Here's beginnings five. of capitalism. Five pound, six there, six pound, and six eight. Eight, ten, yeah. ten, not you, eleven. Eleven, you know, twelve. So 12, here for the first 10, time 13, we meet modern Western 13, people. 13, 13, 13, 13, economically free, property owning, upholders of individual rather than collective values. It was a philosophy which would inherit the earth. Every time I call a name out, you'll have to edit that out, they're all on tax <laughs> Really? <laughs> <laughs> All this while, the great powerhouse of Western culture was still the Fertile Crescent. For the Muslims inherited the legacy of the ancients, and it was in medieval Baghdad that the first great attempt was made to bridge the religions of East and West. 
Through the universities and libraries here, Babylonian astronomy, Hindu mathematics and Chinese science were transmitted to Europe by Arab humanists. It was one of the great multicultural epochs of all time. If one could combine Arabic faith and Jewish intelligence, said one, with an Iraqi education, Christian conduct, Greek knowledge, Indian mysticism, and a Sufi way of life, this would be the perfection of humanity. That dream still stands as one of the greatest of all declarations of faith in an international civilization. Now there comes the event on which the whole course of modern Western history rests. An event which opened unimaginable mental horizons and brought undreamed of wealth flowing back to Europe, renewing and transforming the spiritual empire of Rome, gilding its roofs with Aztec gold. The conquest of the new world. From Mexico to the Andes, the Europeans appropriated the almost limitless resources of the New World, studying its landscape with the churches of Christian gods. The conquest was accompanied by a genocide unparalleled in history. In the century after Columbus, over two-thirds of the native population of the Americas died through disease and violence perhaps as many as 50 million people. Columbus wrote to the Queen of Spain, our European civilization will bring light to the natives in their darkness, but for ourselves we will gain gold, and with gold we will be able to do what we want in the world. The discovery of the New World shifted the centre of gravity of the West, away from its old heartland in the Mediterranean, to the seaboard of northwestern Europe, to nations like Holland and England, Protestant and capitalist. Here in Malden, a small port on the east coast of England, is a symbol of that age, the intact library of a 17th century scholar, Thomas Plume, who endowed the professorship of astronomy at Cambridge. His 7,000 books enable us to step back into the intellectual world of this new civilization of the West at the point of its rise to world domination. Here are translations of Greek and Arabic science. Here's Galileo's vision of the cosmos. Descartes anatomizing the marvels of the human body. But the key figure in the new learning was Francis Bacon. For Bacon saw how science and technology would be used in the future to subdue the other peoples of the planet and ultimately to conquer nature itself. It's Bacon who now appears the prophet of our age and the quintessential Western scientist. This new science, new learning, had 
fateful implications for the future, as Bacon himself understood. For if it were true, as Bacon said, that henceforth in human affairs what was most useful in practice would also be most correct in theory, then truth itself could be defined in terms of utility, usefulness, not in terms of religion and morals. And so man could become a law unto himself, as Bacon said, and depend no more on God. It's one of the founding ideas behind our modern Western scientific civilization, which would go out and exploit and subdue the entire world in the name of that new science. Now the workings of the human body would give up their secrets. The stars and planets could be measured. The world itself subjected to Western definitions of time and space. Mapped on a meridian based on Greenwich. And when the Jesuits first showed the Chinese a map of the whole world, they were taken aback by the knowledge of these so-called barbarians. Up till then, said one, they'd printed maps of the world in which China was all. But when they saw the world so large, and China only a corner of it, they knew in truth that their world had changed. It was industrial revolution which now enabled the small-scale societies of Northern Europe to take a world lead in trade. And this happened first in Britain. Hitherto, most of the great technological advances in history had come from Asia. But now the West leapt ahead, its mobile, individualistic populations becoming predominantly city dwellers in a few generations. The effects on human beings and the environment are still being counted. The industrial city has now spread across the landscape of the world from the plains of India to the Yellow River in China. But it began here in Manchester. Its great buildings, like the town hall from the 1860s, stand as monuments to the ideals of that new civilization. The statues in the entrance are not to poets or gods, but to men of science, Jewell, Dalton and Rutherford, who split the atom here for the first time. The 19th century badge of the city was the Busy Bee. Its motto, through prudence and hard work, the ideals of the new age. Foreign visitors were deeply impressed by this heroic materialism. This is an extraordinarily talented people, said a Chinese diplomat. How can we continue to call them barbarians? For they have taken on the mantle of civilization. On the ceilings are the emblems of virtually all the countries in the world, countries under the trading dominion of the British Empire, the greatest the world had ever seen. Among them, the ancient civilizations of India, China and Japan all now connected by this new form of international culture, manufacturing capitalism. The first cities of the great civilizations in India and China and the Near East had all been in some sense sacred enclosures, but these were emphatically places where money was to be made by hard work. The problems that they encountered in creating these industrial cities were now familiar with all over the world. Population, poverty, health, housing, social order, democracy, and the ways in which they attempted to solve them here, the amenities which they thought were necessary for a civilized city life, have now become the blueprint for the modern city. But the Victorians differed from us in one important respect. 
but they were optimists about the role of the city as an ordering and liberating force in human affairs. It's early summer in Washington, D.C. The leader of the modern West prepares to celebrate victory in the Gulf War of 1991. All around, Egyptian obelisks, Greek and Roman temples proclaim that the United States is the inheritor of the legacy not only of Europe, but of Greece and Rome and Egypt too. Never in history has so much power resided in the hands of one nation. The ideals of this new order are enshrined in marble all around. They're noble ideals. The Lincoln Memorial, modelled on the Parthenon in Athens, commemorates one who, through a brutal civil war, held on to the ideals of the European Enlightenment, the French and American revolutions. The belief that all are born equal, with equal rights to freedom and happiness. To walk this sacred space is to be reminded, too, that there are many ways of seeing history. That history is ever-changing, never definitive, never black and white, and usually with right and wrong on both sides. And each generation must reinterpret history in the life of the nation just as in the life of the individual. In this way, like the pilgrims at the memorial to the Vietnam War, each of us tries to come to terms with our victories and our defeats, our wrongdoing and our suffering, our collective myths and our most cherished ideals. You were flying along and all of a sudden you saw a bad guy. Well, all you have to do is basically look at him and you can shoot him. In our time, the astonishing growth of technology and communications has seen the global village arrive. As a world ideology, our own liberal democratic capitalism would seem to have no rival. And yet, throughout the countries of the rich West, there's a growing and profound disquiet, a feeling that the Western way of life itself is no longer supportable morally or practically because of pollution, environmental destruction, and the continuing exploitation of the mass of humanity. If that disquiet is justified, which surely it is, then the great question for the next generation is simple. Are the values of the West alone enough to guarantee the continuing health of the planet? Those values, as we've seen, are writ large in our history. Individualistic, competitive, acquisitive, always pushing outwards, never happy in an empty room, as Pascal said. And yet it's the bearers of that vision of life, the rulers of the West, who hold in their hands the future of the planet. It feels at this moment 
as if the West, at the very moment of its triumph, has reached that point which comes to all civilizations, when, if they're not to decline, they must transform themselves by learning from others. The crisis of earth and spirit we now face cannot be solved by any one nation, but only by reaching out to the other peoples, traditions and religions of the planet in a dialogue beyond anything seen before. Great alternative traditions are still alive at the end of our destructive century. Living testimony to the riches of humanity's past. As valuable to all life on Earth as the rainforests, these are the rainforests of the spirit. The goal of civilization, said the greatest of all historians, the Arab Ibn al-Khaldun, is settled life and the achievement of luxury. But there is a limit which cannot be overstated. When prosperity and luxury come to a people, they're followed by excessive consumption and extravagance. With that, he says, the human soul itself is undermined, both in its worldly well-being and in its spiritual life. There's one last journey in this search for the origins of civilization. A journey back to the starting point, to southern Iraq, to the Garden of Eden and to Uruk, the first city on earth. Here the great revolution happened 5,000 years ago, when people first tried to live in large-scale urban societies. It's now reduced to barren desert by ecological catastrophe. Here, the ancient Sumerians, the creators of civilization, told a myth about its origins. It was, they said, a devil's bargain, for it offered all the joys of life, the arts of music and sex, law, justice, and the noblest ideals of humanity. But it also brought destruction, violence, cruelty and fear. All this is civilization, said the Sumerian god of wisdom. And if you wish its benefits, you must take all its qualities. It is for you to use them with restraint and with wisdom.